This is the word of God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for, pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God, and the Lord, Jesus Christ. So far, the reading from God's word. May God add his blessing as his word is proclaimed this morning. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, when Paul wrote this second letter to the church of the Thessalonians, he was writing to a church experiencing the kind of persecution, the kind of tribulation that had been all too common for all of Christ's churches during this time. So in his second letter to them, he begins right after establishing their minds, uh, right after establishing in their minds rather, the gracious provision of both grace and peace from God, right after commenting on their abundant growth in faith and love, he begins the meat of this letter by applying what he's already pointed out, the gracious provision of God, by applying that to their immediate circumstances. God, he'll argue here, the very same God who is holding them up and who is strengthening them in their persecutions, this God is the God who will fulfill his purposes, both for them and for their persecutors. With that in mind, I'll bring God's word to you this morning under this theme— In the day of judgment, God will display his just judgment on both his saints and on their persecutors. We'll look first at the just rewards that he gives, second at God's just judge, and third we'll see how God displays this just judgment in answer to the prayers of his people. So first, God displays his just judgment on both saints and their persecutors with just rewards. In verse 4 of this opening chapter of 2 Thessalonians, Paul recorded his boast in the Thessalonians' faith and steadfastness. Paul held up this church as a church worthy of imitation. Just as the church in Thessalonica had, had copied the examples of the church's in in Judea by remaining steadfast under persecution, and you can read about that in 1 Thessalonians. So now also, Paul wanted Christ's churches in Achaia, in, in the region around Corinth, where Paul was living during this time, he wanted those churches to copy the faith and the steadfastness of the Thessalonian believers. 
But here in verse 5, Paul introduces something new. He lets the Thessalonian church know that somehow the persecution that they're enduring, along with the faith and the steadfastness that they're demonstrating under that persecution, somehow this is an evidence of the righteous judgment of God. This, that, that is their steadfastness and their, pers- and, and, and their faith in all their persecutions and afflictions, this, verse 5, is an evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Now, what exactly does this mean? Paul is making clear to the Thessalonians his confidence in them, in the truth of their calling, in their worthiness for the kingdom of God, and in the witness that their suffering is producing. So first, Paul is confident in the truth or the security of their calling. He wants the church to know that that the fact that God is supplying them with what they need to get through their trials is a sure sign of God's favor. They are God's people, and God is supplying them. This is what he means when he says, this is evidence. God's supply of steadfastness clearly shows that God is on their side, that God has called them to his kingdom. But more than that, Paul tells them secondly, that their perseverance under trials is bringing about a clear demonstration of their worthiness for the kingdom of God. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God that you may be considered worthy. There is some kind of process at work in which God is demonstrating them to be worthy of his kingdom. Now, it would have been easy for these Thessalonian believers to see their trials as evidence of the fact that God had had, had abandoned them. Uh, But Paul takes this evidence and flips it around. This is, in fact, evidence that God favors them and is at work in the church. And when we ourselves face trials, it's so easy to just view them from the surface. And sometimes a bad reading of the Old Testament will actually compound this. We can see things like disease or or poverty or even persecution as, as punishment. But when we see with eyes that are on the lookout for God's purpose in our lives when we begin to look with senses that are attuned to the work of the Spirit, and if we pray for discernment to see God's hidden purposes, then like Paul in Romans 8.28, we can say of all of our trials, for those who love God, all things, yes, all things work together for good. For those who love God, who are the called according to His purpose. And with Joseph in Genesis, we can look at our trials and say with confidence that God means this also for good. And a third thing that Paul is making clear here, though he doesn't state it outright, is that this faithfulness, this allegiance to the kingdom of God was, as he tells a different church, the Philippian church in Philippians 1.28, this allegiance to the kingdom of God is a sure sign to their persecutors of their destruction but of your salvation, and that from God. So in the case of the Philippians, and also in the case of the Thessalonians, the perseverance of the believers clearly demonstrated the fact that God himself was making them strong. In the words of Gamaliel in Acts 5.39, and remember here, Gamaliel was himself a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, the Jewish high council that was persecuting the church in Jerusalem. Gamaliel said, if it is, that is, if the church is, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. The staying power of the church made it clear to both believers and to unbelievers that God was on the side of his people. And then to assault the church was to assault God, to go after the apple of his eye. How you handle God's gospel determines how God will handle you in the final reckoning. If you oppose the gospel on the one hand, if you oppose the gospel, you are opposing God and you will be judged accordingly. 
But if you obey the gospel's command of faith, then God makes it clear that he will be on your side. So Paul moves on in his next section to those who oppose the gospel. This is clear evidence of the righteous judgment of God, since indeed, verse 6, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. That word since here in verse 6 is important. It, It makes it clear that there is a direct connection between how the persecutors treated the believers and how the persecutors were themselves going to be treated on the day of judgment. Paul makes it clear here that God will only punish in this way those who actively took wrath upon themselves. By persecuting those who clearly belong to the kingdom of God, they were openly rebelling against the king. What's abundantly clear here is that just as the Old Testament law demanded that the punishment fit the crime, think of what God tells the people in Exodus 21, 24, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Just as the Old Testament law demanded that the punishment fit the crime, so God would deal in perfect justice with those who persecuted his people. Paul is making it clear that when God is the one administering justice, all judgments are perfect. And Paul carries on with this logic when he comes again to God's evaluation of the Thessalonian church. God considers it just, now verse 7, to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us. To these Christians, God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And the point that Paul's making here is that it will be just for God to bring them into his joy, into his glory. Now, my initial reaction to what verses 6 and 7 is saying was to say something like, no, no, Paul, it's not justice, it's grace. And when I was wrestling with this part of the text, that was kind of a sticking point for me. How can this be justice? Doesn't that just bring us back to some kind of works righteousness? But it is just. It is just for God not only to repay evil for evil, but also to repay service with reward. In Hebrews 6, 9 and 10, the author of that book tells the Christians that he is assured of their salvation. And not only that, but he is also sure that God, in accordance with his justice, will reward their faithfulness. For God, he writes, is not unjust so as to overlook your work and and the love you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. So whether our faithfulness looks like the loving service of the Hebrew Christians, whether faithfulness for us looks like the endurance under tribulation that the Thessalonians modeled, faithfulness will receive a just reward from God. But this promised just reward is a gift of grace. It's not a question of meriting salvation, as we confess in question and answer 63 of the Catechism. But those rewards that God promises, those rewards are gifts of grace. See, God has graciously promised that he will reward those that are faithful to him. Every act of faithfulness in this life will be repaid both in this life and in the next. As Jesus told his disciples in Mark 10, 29, and 30, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. There is a tremendous blessing promised to faithful servants of the gospel. And then Paul moves on in verse 7 to demonstrate to us just how these rewards will be given. God's just judgment, both on his persecuted saints and on their persecutors, will be carried out by none other than the Lord Jesus. God considers it just, 
to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Now, depending on which side you're on, this is either the best news you've ever heard, or it's the worst thing you could possibly hear. See, there will be two very distinct reactions when Jesus comes in glory. There will be terror, and there will be rejoicing. Those who rebelled against him, those who refused his gospel, will be terrified. We're told in the gospels that they will beg the mountains to fall on them. They'll be terrified. But for those who long for his appearing, they will say, yes, this God is mine. And they will share in his glory. For those who rebelled against God, Jesus' revelation from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire will be terrifying. Remember Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares? At harvest time, the master of the field sends his servants out to collect the weeds into bundles and to burn them. And as Jesus explains to his disciples, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The harvest is the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and they will throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For those opposed to God, the presence of his angels is a sign of his awful judgment. Paul also describes Jesus as being in flaming fire. And this is a reference back to Isaiah 66, 15, where God tells his persecuted Old Testament people that the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire, the Lord will enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh. And those slain by the Lord will be many. The Lord will inflict this terrible judgment, our text tells us, on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, this here is not talking about two distinct groups of unbelievers, but Paul has in mind those who have rejected the gospel and the gospel's call for faith and therefore who do not know God. They have made a decision to say no to the lordship of Christ and they will be treated in accordance with their rebellion. And rebellion is the right word here. See, God created the world and all who live on it. And as their creator, he is their rightful Lord. And so anytime anyone refuses to acknowledge him as Lord, they are committing the highest form of treason possible. And as we've seen all along in this passage so far, in the judgment of God, the punishment always fits the crime. They refuse any association with Christ here on earth, and their eternal punishment fits with that crime. Paul writes in verse 9, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his might. In life they made it clear that they wanted nothing to do with Christ. And when death comes, their wish is granted. Understand this, that there is no greater sin than remaining apart from Christ. And there is no greater punishment than being removed altogether from his presence. That is the true horror of hell. The outer darkness is darkness because there is no light. There is no joy. There is no love of any kind. There is only weeping and gnashing of teeth. If by this point we were unconvinced that the missionary call that lies on every Christian also lay on us, the doctrine of hell should drive that folly from us. Understanding that this is what awaits our unbelieving neighbors should put us on our knees before the throne of God in repentance. Our neighbors need to be reconciled to Christ. Hell should make us weep for them. And hell should also make us missionaries to them. 
But on the other hand, For those of us who, like the Thessalonians, have made the Most High our refuge, the return of Christ is going to be glorious. We'll see him on the clouds of heaven. The judge, like our catechism says, the judge who has already offered himself to the judgment of God in my place and has removed the whole curse from me. We'll see the one who has ascended to heaven and and has been interceding for his beloved before the throne of his father. We'll see the glorious bridegroom coming back for his bride, the exalted one coming to exalt those who were proud to call, uh, call him their own. Remember again the parable of the wheat and the tares. That parable also says something about the final reward of the saints. In that parable, the landowner tells his, workles, tells his workers to gather the wheat into his barn. And when Jesus explains the parable, he has this to say about glorified Christians. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. From the perspective of those included in the harvest of righteousness, the parable of the wheat and the tares is yet another reason for joy. There is glory for the saints at Christ's return. As our text says, he comes on that day, verse 10, he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all those who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Those who avoided Christ in this life will have their wish to be left alone granted in the next. But those who believe, those who are happy to be associated with Christ in this life, they will also spend eternity with him. And not just in his general vicinity, but as the text says, he'll be glorified in his saints and marveled at among all those who have believed. See, the wicked are removed from the presence of the Lord, but the believers are brought near to the presence of the Lord. And Paul finishes this short teaching on the return of Christ by focusing his attention back to the Thessalonian believers themselves. At the end of verse 10, because our testimony to you was believed. In previous verses, Paul had proclaimed his confidence that their eter- uh, in their eternal destiny by pointing to their endurance in the face of affliction, by their, uh, to their growth in faith and love. And now he gives his greatest reason for confidence of all. Paul is convinced that Christ will be glorified not just in his saints, but in his saints in this particular church in Thessalonica, because the testimony that he had presented to them, the gospel message that the Christ needed to suffer and die, and that Jesus was that Christ, this gospel message was accepted by them. They had heard the word, and the Spirit had opened their hearts to believe. The first key of the kingdom had done its opening work. And because they believed his report, their eternal destiny was secure. Because they believed in the Christ that Paul preached, and because they demonstrated their faith with faithfulness in persecution, Paul has every reason, and they themselves had every right to believe that God had judged them worthy of the kingdom of heaven. And it's this worthiness in the face of judgment that Paul now prays about in verses 11 and 12. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll remember back in the first point, Paul had talked about the Thessalonians being considered worthy of the kingdom of God. Now here in his prayer, he's emphasizing something slightly different. He's not praying that God would consider them worthy. He's praying that God would make them worthy of the call of the gospel. In his previous letter, in 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, 11 through 12, he wrote that like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, and encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. 
And now he goes a step further than just exhorting, encouraging, and charging. He moves his requests from earth to heaven. Now often, when we think of God's work of growing his church, our minds go straight to the preaching of the word. And they should. But God makes it clear that his church is not only built up by the preaching of the gospel, God also builds his church through the ministry of prayer. Think of what Peter said about the primary ministry of the apostles in Jerusalem. It was a ministry of teaching and prayer. Think of the command that Christ gave to his disciples to pray for the coming of the kingdom. Think of the promise that Christ gives to his disciples in Luke eleven nine: 9. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. In verse 13 of that same chapter, he tells them that if sinful parents are willing to give good gifts to their children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Prayer is crucial in the ministry of any church. It was crucial in Thessalonica. It's crucial here. See, just as the Thessalonians could not have come, And just as we could not have come to faith without the work of the Spirit, so now any work of faith, any resolve for good, for the continued building of the church, will be impossible without the work of God's Spirit. We can make all the resolutions we want. We can do all the work we want. But without power from on high, there is no power down below. Without God's presence with His church, in His church, there is no power in the church. The church can only carry out the work of glorifying Christ by the power of Christ's Spirit. And having presented His requests, this is where Paul goes next in verse 12. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him. When Paul prays for a worthy church, Paul prays for a glory-oriented church. This brings us back to verse 10, where Paul had spent some time exalting in the judgment of God that would glorify his saints in their Lord's presence. Paul's request before the throne of grace is in the first place that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. Remember again, in the judgment of God, the reward fits the recipient. So Paul prays that the Lord may be glorified in them, not only because the Lord is worthy of all praise, but also so that at the judgment, those who glorified Christ will in turn be glorified by Christ. What a thing to pray for. The glory of Christ in his church is the basic reason that the church exists. It's what Peter said in his first epistle. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church's chief end is to glorify God. We must pray for this kind of church. And we must add to our prayers faithful efforts to make it so. This is, after all, what any resolve for good or work of faith must be about. Everything that we do at at church, at work, at home, at school, everything we do has to be for this purpose, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He tells these Thessalonians that he is praying for Christ's glory in them but he's also praying for their glorification in Christ. This gift of glory, which Paul says is, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, this gift is a gospel gift. Remember, without grace, without Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, none of this is ours. Without Christ's experience of the horrors of hell on our behalf, we receive no rewards. We receive no grace. We receive no glory. Without Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, the only verdict that God can issue, the only verdict that God can issue in our case is guilty 
But praise be to God. According to his grace, he has not only taken us from the domain of darkness and sin and brought us into his kingdom of light, he has also promised us glory in that kingdom. And this is the promise that allows us to look forward to the day of the Lord with eager expectation. This promise of glory allows us to long for his appearing. This promise of glory allows us to say, Maranatha, come Lord. Amen.